the fast for his own purposes. This is not something that's necessarily for our purpose, but God chose the fast for his own divine purposes. And I need you to know that spiritual fasting, that is denying the body food for spiritual reasons, has been a part of the Word of God from the beginning. The Old Testament and the New Testament is filled not only with instructions about and the purpose for, but also examples of men and women who fasted for spiritual reasons. Actually, in Isaiah chapter 58, and during this particular uh, uh, fast, you may choose to actually read and study and internalize Isaiah chapter 58 because it's all about why people want things from God and don't get them. And he talks particularly about people who fast and still don't get an answer and how that you can fast in a proper way and get answers. But here's what it says in Isaiah 58 beginning at verse 6. He asks this question. This is God himself speaking through the prophet Isaiah. Is not this the fast that I choose? So I need to tell you on the outset that God chooses for his people to fast. So he said, there is a fast that I have chosen. And I choose a fast, and he begins to say, and they are for these purposes, to loose the bonds of wickedness. I'm curious this morning if there is anybody personally feel that you are constrained or bound somehow limited by the wickedness that surrounds us in this culture and is it possible that you have a family member, a husband, a wife, a child, a relative, a co-worker that is bound as it were by the chains of wickedness that surrounds us in this godless culture. Can you see that? He said, I've chosen a fast to loose the bonds of wickedness to undo the straps of the yoke. The yoke is actually that device that was made of wooden. Uh, 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 the carpenters, uh, perhaps Joseph, the father of Jesus, might have, among other things, made a yoke that would fit on a, a, a pair of oxen, and they would labor together, uh, literally constrained with no liberty of their own. Uh, beast of burden, they are called. And he said, there is a yoke, uh, a burden that Satan will put upon my people, but the purpose for the, the fast is to undo the straps of the yoke, and to let the oppressed go free. My God, freedom is something that I think evades us. We live in a land of so-called freedom, but we are out of options and out of choices. And God said, I want you to be free. And he said, I want to actually not just loose the straps and take the yoke from off you, but I actually want to break the yoke. That is the purpose for the fast that God has chosen. Now, in the book of Matthew, chapter 6, beginning at verse 17, our Lord is speaking here uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, where literally the new fundamentals of what the church would ultimately be like and what would be expected of believers and disciples of Jesus Christ, this entire plan is being laid out in this phenomenal message. And Jesus says in verse 17, But when you fast... So Jesus is not saying to his followers, if you choose to fast, if it happens to fit into your lifestyle, if it's something you feel particularly drawn to do, some will, some won't. He's saying to all believers, when you fast, and then he begins to saying there's a way to go about it. When you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. He is saying, listen, whenever you are in this fasting process, don't go around with a long face. Don't refuse to shave. Don't look like you're a homeless person that's been so that you can get pity from people. Instead, wash your face, wash your hair, put on a bright smile, and go about your business just like nothing is going on. It's no burden whatsoever. So he said, when you do it, do it like this, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting. But... To your father. You don't appear to men to be fasting, but to your father. You appear to your father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Now this is not new preaching and I'm not even going to preach here this morning. But here in the book of Matthew, our Lord actually teaches what I like to call threefold obedience. It was the, it was the wise man Solomon who said that, a, that a, a rope or a cord of three strands is hard to break. I believe that one of the reasons that we're easily broken uh, in the modern church is that we walk in single strand obedience when we are commanded to walk in threefold obedience. He said here in this instruction, when you give... 
That's popular. That's about as popular as turning off the television. When you give, when you pray, and when you fast. He said, when you give, give in a certain way. Whenever you pray, pray in a certain way. Don't pray before men to be seen of them, but go into the closet, close the door, and the Father who sees you praying in secret will reward you in an open and a public way. And when you fast, threefold obedience. I want you to engage in all three of those the first 21 days of the year so that God sees that you're serious about effecting change in your life and in the world where he has planted you. So he said, when you fast... The Father who sees in secret will reward you open. You may fast in secret. You may pray in secret. You may give so secretly that the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. But the Father who sees in secret will publicly bless you so that everyone near you will not be able to deny that you have been alone with God. Amen. One of the reasons that the church is so anemic is that the church is a stealth church and Christians are stealth Christians. And if God is blessing us, nobody knows. We've got the same debt. We've got the same marital problems. We've got the same kids messed up on drugs, caught up in premarital sex, dabbling in pornography online. We've got the same mess the world has got. And the world cannot tell that the church is being blessed. If you will walk in threefold obedience, God will publish what he is doing in your family and in your life and in the church. Can you give him praise? So here's what we're inclined. I'm setting you up and then I've got five points to make and I'll sweep through them because th this is one of those sermons that could be a, a five day sermon and we're just going to do it in about the next 25 minutes. The problem with fasting the first year that we had a fast here, the first year, it was my, I, I became a pastor in July uh, of 2007, and in January 2008, I called a fast at this church. This church had been a struggling church and a broken church and a church that was hurting financially, and there needed to be a remedy. There needed to be a turnaround. Something needed to happen. I'm a brand new pastor. I don't know that hundreds of thousands of people fast 21 days in January. I'm not trying to be like somebody else. I didn't read it in a book or get an idea online. I felt like I heard from God, and I called the church to fast. I actually brought a document up here and said, if you will fast, I want you to sign this. My God, I got 115 signatures on there and I don't think we were running 60 people at the time but everybody wanted to fast I mean they, we were serious and we were in and I said you know go I, I did the best I could I think I said go see your doctor who knows in those days I didn't know much about what I was doing and so so we had prayer meeting on Tuesday morning the fast started on Monday on Tuesday morning we were there and and, and we were all rejoicing and hungry and and, and, and all five of us Or maybe it was four. I don't want to exaggerate. And so, so by, the, by the next Tuesday, I mean, some of us are actually not eating. You know, I mean, we got some people went on the Daniel fast. The Daniel fast is like finding a new place to eat. We're going to take out meats, but we're going to put in some candy-coated nuts. You know, I mean, I ran into people in the grocery store with their cart brimming over. What's going on? We're on the Daniel fast. I said, man, if Daniel eat all of that, no wonder he gained weight while the king was. I'm just saying. But some of us didn't eat. So I had this little guy in the church, you know, he's about 80 years old or something like that. And he come to the prayer meeting on the eighth day of the fast. And, and, he, comes in, and he comes through the back door and, and he's kind of leaning like this a little bit. And he's gray, no color at all. I said, are you okay? He said, yeah, I'm fine. So you doing this fast? Yeah. I didn't know he wasn't eating anything. He wasn't eating. It's was eight days. I said, are you drinking plenty? He said, well, my wife says I'm not. So you got to drink plenty because we usually drink whenever we're eating and you're not. Are, are you eating anything? No. Make sure you drink plenty. We went into prayer meeting. He passed out like a rock. I'm serious. Fell on, right, right in the floor, man. There he was. I'm just simply, I'm a brand new preacher, man. I don't know nothing. You all, some of you are here. I, I could not have known. I didn't even know what I didn't know. I didn't know what questions to ask, much less what the answers were. And here's this guy that's passed out at my prayer meeting because I called a fast. So, so we did the spiritual thing. We dialed 911. <laughs> so I'm following the ambulance down there. And I'm saying, man, what kind of a fool am I? 
Man, I called a fast, and now I got this guy. He's passed out. I hope he lives. I get down to the emergency room. Finally, I get back in there to see him. They got him all hooked up on IV, and the doctor's in there says, I'm just going to go ahead and call his name. He said, well, Mr. Ringley? <laughs> Helen said, I told him he wasn't drinking enough. I said, Mr. Ringley, you're dehydrated. Have you been drinking? He said, my wife said I hadn't. So why aren't you drinking? He said, well, we're on a fast. So what do you mean you're on a fast? Well, my, my pastor, he said he called the whole church to, to fast and pray. He said, you mean fast or you mean not eat? He said, yeah. He said, well, what kind of a cult operation is he running down there? I'm just standing over in the corner <laughs> waiting for an opportunity to pray. I'm just saying that I walked out of that room questioning God, my God. I got Jim there, and, and I'm hungry myself, and I don't know. Uh, this is crazy. And I went home to my prayer closet, and I told God, I said, if I have missed you in this, tell me, because I, I, want, I just want to do your will. I thought I heard from you. And so I kept going, and the next Sunday was, was day 14. By the time I come to the pulpit on the 14th day, I'm saying, God, we, we need to hear from you. We need to know somehow. And as it turned out, Misty, on the 14th day, we're receiving members. And I'd said, you know, if you want to be a member of the church, just let me know. And, and most people hadn't let me know. And that morning, I called people to come down, and they all lined all the way across the front. I couldn't believe how many were there. And there they were, and I received all those members. And the next day on Monday, I called Brother Paul, the church clerk, and I said, how many members did we take in yesterday? He said, 20 more. I thought, well, that's, a, that's an interesting number. So I just kept going forward. And the next Sunday was the day 21. And I said, if you need deliverance and you need healing, you need God to do something in your life, just come down after the end of the message. And I prayed for people for an hour who were sick in their bodies, and God did multiple miracles. And as a last thought, in those days we still received an offering, but some of you remember I, I would forget to pass the offering plate. That was, I was a Sunday school teacher for 30 years. We didn't pass the offering plate, so I wasn't used to that yet. So I'd forget. Boy, we needed the money. So I'm down there praying for people like, forgot to receive the offering. Oh, people are already, I've been praying for an hour. A lot of people are already gone. But it wasn't just that. God spoke to my heart, and he said, there are some people here that need a financial blessing. So I just said, hey, if you need a financial blessing, we forgot to, we forgot to pass the offering plate, so we just, there's one up here. If you, if you need a, God to do something in your life, just come up here. And I said, I'm not a TV preacher, but just sow a seed. Just give, if, if what you have in your hand is not enough to meet your need, it's your seed, so sow it. So they just come down and put some money the next day, on Monday, the church clerk called me and said, Pastor Mitchell, I just wanted you to know that we counted the offering and it was, it was $21,000. <laughs> you, you don't know how important that is. In those days, we didn't get no $21,000 offering. I mean, God was just all over that. And God worked in people's lives all the rest of that next year. And God multiplied this church and lifted it from a low place and set it on a solid rock. And, and listen, sit, someday, son, we will do the math. I, I, would like, I would just like some time to add up how many tens of thousands of people have come through this doors of this church since it should have gone out of business. I'd like to just know how many hundreds of people have come to know Jesus since this church should have closed its doors and gone out of business. But in response to the fast and to the praying, God set this church on a course and on a direction of multiplied success. Can you give him praise? Now, I spent all that time to do that to tell you, so now we come to the current problem. We've been fasting every January since, and now I have people excited about it because they're peeking out Thanksgiving all the way to Christmas and calling me and saying, when is the fast, Pastor? 
because I got a few pounds I need to take off. I'm just simply saying, let's don't miss the point. Let's don't play games with the holy. Let's don't imagine that this is some sort of a man of war weight loss program. And let's not allow ourselves to get trapped into dismissing and demeaning the significant things of God. There are a lot of ways of examining history. Uh, recently, my son and I were talking about history. And the interesting thing about history are how many lessons it contains and how willing we are to ignore the lessons of history. We don't seem to learn from it, right? We just keep repeating our same mistakes. Uh, sometimes we call them generational sins. Sometimes it's just generational stupidity. Don't do what your daddy did. It didn't work for him. It won't work for you. Right? So sometimes we could just learn from history if we would, but we won't. There's a lot of ways to examine history. You can study history by just looking at the great men who, who made significant uh, impact on history throughout uh, the centuries. Or you can look at the major events like wars and famines and pestilences and see how those marked the course of human events. Or you could look at, at art or music or literature and see how those things shaped who we are. I, I'm going to do something odd and peculiar today and I'm going to look at how eating or failing to do so altered the course of the history of humanity. Can you believe it? There are five meals that literally, each of them, so significant that it changed the course of humanity. And I'm setting you up. I want you to know that for you, it might not be for everybody, but it could be for you. By your willingness to obey the words of our Lord. By your willingness to heed the words of the prophet Isaiah when he said, This is a fast that I, Jehovah, have chosen. And if you will do it, you will receive certain benefits and walk under my favor. If you would just listen to what God has to say about refraining from eating, your choice concerning food could not only change the course of your life, but impact your family as well. And I'll prove it to you from the pages of Scripture. Let's go, first of all, to the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, chapter 2, we find there that a meal took place in Genesis, chapter 2, beginning at verse 15. It says, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden. Isn't it interesting that God's first command has to do with eating and not eating? I was just asking the question, what's the big deal about a fast? The first command that God gives to the man is about eating and not eating, but he says, verse 17, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now we see that clearly. God created everything that is. He made the heavens and the earth. He gave it to mankind as a gift. He said, live here in this paradise. Take dominion over it, rule over it, and live here in happiness in your relationship with me. He made us male and female and gave us dignity and value and purpose and worth in his image and likeness and said that we could eat anything that we wanted, but there was one thing off limits, one exception, and it was that meal. Our first parents, Adam and Eve, had literally the world at their fingertips, and they sat down and ate the one thing that God said, don't eat. And it changed the course of humanity forever. See, we are driven by natural hunger. We hunger for many things, but the hunger for food is the most pervasive. You eat, and in a matter of hours, you're hungry again. You eat, and in a matter of hours, you're hungry again. About three times a day, you need to find something to satisfy that gnawing hunger. And God said, you are hungry, and you can be satisfied with these things. But man quickly chose to eat the wrong thing. And in doing so, he set us on a course that altered humanity. See, we are inclined, I want you to hear me, we are inclined to prefer 
certain of God's instruction and to esteem what we will and say, I'll do this, but I won't do that. I prefer this, but I won't do that. I, I don't mind coming to church, but I'm not going to get engaged in Bible study. I don't mind attending Bible study, but I'm not going to actually pray. I don't mind praying, but I'm certainly not going to give. And we look through his instructions and say, I'll do this, but I won't do that. I will esteem this, but I will not esteem that. And our forefathers did the same thing whenever God said, it matters what you eat and what you do not eat. And they ignored it and ate the wrong thing and brought sin and damnation upon us all. And that was the first meal. The second meal takes place later because we quickly then would walk through the remainder of the book of Genesis and we would find that God encounters a guy named Abraham and he makes promises to him that through you and your wife, even though you are elderly, I'm going to give you a son and through that offspring of that son, you will be blessed and all of the uh, nations of the earth will be blessed through you and I will raise up a great nation from you. And, of course, we know that in that promise was even the remedy for the sin. When Adam and Eve committed what theologians call the original sin, God selected Abraham, and in that process, he began literally the bloodline from whom would come the Messiah. So he put in place immediately a remedy and a plan where Christ would come and deal with with our sin problem, our problem of rebellion. So if you go through all of the book of Genesis, you will find the offspring of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob as they begin to grow and increase. And by the time we get to the end of the book of Genesis, that family has grown to a number of approximately 60. They're living somewhere in the desert and suddenly there is famine that surrounds them and there's no food. And driven of all things by what? The hunger and the need for food, they find themselves in Egypt. I'm not telling the story of Joseph and all of that, but they end up in Egypt, and that Pharaoh is very friendly to the offspring of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and there they multiply, and they continue to grow until this 60 people becomes literally millions. They become a nation, and suddenly a godless man, a Pharaoh, rises in the land who did not know Joseph and did not know uh, anything about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and he despised the the, the Hebrews, he despised the offspring of Jacob. The, 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 the Israelites, he despised them. He turned them into slaves. He was abusive. He, he beat them. He was, he was harsh upon them. And, and they began to cry out, and their voices, their prayers were heard in the heavenlies. And God sends a man named Moses. And you know Moses marched in front of this knothead Pharaoh guy and said, you're going to have to let my people go. If you don't, you're going to. And so plague after plague. I'm going to give you a chance. He wouldn't hear it. I'm going to give you another chance. He wouldn't hear it. My God, I wish somebody would hear this today. How many times has God pecked you on the head? So I'm going to give you another chance. I'm merciful. And we just kind of keep in our rebellion, plunging on, doing our own thing, going our own way. Finally, God said, I've had it with you. One more chance. If you, don't, if you don't obey me, I'm going to kill the firstborn of every son throughout all the land of Egypt. And the only way to escape, the only way to escape is going to be provided in a meal. Meal number two, the Passover meal. Every household is going to receive an instruction, but not the household of Pharaoh, not the offspring of Pharaoh. I want you to get this, because somebody in the household was obedient and heard the word of the Lord and prepared a lamb. And from the lamb they saved the blood. And with the blood they painted it on the doorpost because one person in the household was obedient and led the way in the Passover meal. Then the entire household was preserved. By choosing what to eat and not to eat, by obeying him in the fast, it's not simply that you will be touched and that your own life will be blessed, but everyone in your household will be a partaker in the blessing when you are obedient in doing what God said. My God, I wish that it was possible for me to get into the minds and the heads of moms and dads, dads who have neglected their a God-appointed position, moms who are distracted and trying to be all things. I mean, isn't it interesting how we've turned moms into super moms? I, I bless you for what you do, but you work a full-time job and you are supposed to keep your husband happy and get your kids educated and be the nurse and the doctor and, 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 and all of the things that you try to do. God never meant for you to do all that. He really wants you to be narrowly focused on raising godly offspring. 
And if you do that, you will have accomplished enough in your lifetime. And that's possible because we're all so materialistic minded and so we got to have two incomes. And my God, you start talking about the idea of just the dad going into the marketplace and the mother obeying of all things scripture that said mothers are to be, wives are to be the lover of their husband and the lover of their children and keep her at home. That's such an old world idea that it's offensive to even suggest. And if you wanted to obey it, you wouldn't know where to begin. But I want you to know that if you'll find a way to obey the precepts of God, it's not that you will be blessed, but that your entire household will be blessed because of your decision to obey. So I'm not off topic. I want us to understand that somebody in the family needs to rise up and be obedient in this fast and see what God will actually do. So, so, so the Passover meal is the second meal. And, 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 and the beautiful thing that takes place then is nothing more. I want you to hear this. It's nothing more than a picture of redemption. The Passover meal is a foreshadowing of the slaying of the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. It was John the Beloved who in Revelation chapter 5, he looked into the throne room and saw one standing in the center of the throne. He was as a lamb slain before the foundation. And here, unknown to this people who are simply being obedient, in Exodus chapter 12, they are obeying the, obeying the instructions of, of, of the man of God, and in doing so, they are creating a foreshadowing of the coming Messiah and the price that he would pay and so that so that not just simply that the death angel would pass over and the fourth firstborn would be spared but whenever the Lamb of God would lay down his life and his blood would be poured out whenever he sees the blood then your sin is forgiven he doesn't judge but he passes over and you are redeemed and justified because of the death of the Lamb of God so this meal it's not just eating and not eating but it holds great symbolism and great truth in heaven itself and so so this this meal is actually a, a foretelling of what would actually happen later on Calvary that's the second meal now for thousands of years God's people get together every year to celebrate the Passover and to remember how that the death angel came through the land but because that blood was on the doorpost that they alone were preserved and they told the story and they redid the celebration and suddenly one day in a stall in Bethlehem as we have just celebrated Jesus comes to earth Emmanuel God with us and he grows up and becomes a young man and by the age of 30 we find him participating in Passovers and and suddenly on his way to the cross just at the time for Passover, we find him in the upper room. Now we're, now we're approaching the third significant meal. Now he sits down there to, to have the Passover meal with his disciples. And he assumes the role of head of house. And he follows the prescribed instructions from Exodus chapter 12 to the letter. The breaking of the bread and the, and the participation in the meal. And he does everything according to protocol. But then in this third meal, he introduces something that has never happened before. We find it in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 26. And there it says, now as they were eating, Jesus took the bread like they had done for thousands of years. And after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body. Whoa. You get this. He's saying to the disciples, I want you to get this. All of the Passover meals, all of these centuries, all of this eating of this meal, it was always all about me. Whoa. It's all about me. We come to church, we really want to talk about two things. Jesus and how to get to him. Jesus and how to get to him. Nothing else matters. I mean, the church is engaged in everything else. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. Let's just talk about Jesus. He said, the meal was not about how merciful God was that your oldest son, it was always about me. It's here. Everything that you've been thinking about and dreaming about and talking about all of that time, it's all fulfilled now in me. Sin for all mankind will be forgiven. People will be reconciled to God. Jesus will, in fact, be put to death. The lamb will be slain. It's all about me. Now, we know going forward that what he said that night came to pass. In a matter of hours, his body was broken just like the bread. 
His blood poured out just like the red wine. The sacrifice was complete. He's, and, and, and in Luke chapter 22, he moves us then toward the fourth meal, a meal that you all are familiar with. And I want to address this just very quickly in the time that I have. He said to them, this is my body, which is given for you. But he didn't end that. He said, do this in remembrance of me. So after Jesus died and resurrected and then appeared uh, to, to, to hundreds of people to make sure that there was no question that he had in fact risen from the dead, then they immediately began to celebrate the Last Supper. Uh, we call it communion, the Lord's table or the Lord's Supper. Uh, you've seen the painting by Leonardo da Vinci of the Last Supper. That is the fourth meal, and now we engage in that. And when we do it, we do it in remembrance of his sacrifice and also remembering his promise that he will come again to receive us unto himself, right? So, so, so that is the fourth meal. So Mitchell, if that meal is so important, then why don't we do it every time that we come into the house of the Lord? I, I would actually love to. But I would submit a couple of things to you. First of all, churches get so large to where it's difficult to execute that so that it has any value or meaning in such large crowds. And we're not large, but we're a growing church. Uh, second, when you do it every Sunday, it, it, it becomes just a ritual. And, and it loses its meaning. So, well, then why don't we do it more often? We could do it more often. But I, I, I want you to find a way. I, I, I'm not saying this to judge you, and I'm not saying it to be condescending to you, but you ought to be engaged in communion on a regular basis with your family. You ought to do it regularly, Misty, with the choir. You ought to do it regularly in your Sunday school class. Men's council, you ought to do it whenever you come together. When there are small group settings, when you're alone, you can do it by yourself in remembrance of Him. It does not have to be a meal that you have with friends, but any time that you do it, you do it remembering his sacrifice and remember his promise that he will come again. He said, do it. Remember me. The things that I've said, they are true. So, so I would submit to you that we turn a lot of things into rituals, into patterns, and they become ineffective in the church. I, 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 I'm, I'm not being ugly, but I know a lot of people that, that in their own pride and their arrogance, they engage in communion, but their mind is not upon Jesus. That was the very thing that the Apostle Paul was preaching about in, in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, when he said, whenever you come to receive communion to the Last Supper, you, you, you're, you're not qualified. Your mind's on everything else. You come to drink so you can get drunk. You come to eat so you can get full. You come so you can look at the girls and, 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 and wonder whether is your hair okay and when you go down to get communion your mind's on everything but him that's not communion he said when you do it it's about me it's always entirely about me that's why a lot of times on Sunday morning before I come out here and see you if I've got someone in the office that will participate with me we do communion together and if not I do it alone because it has a way of putting everything in perspective if he gave his only son how would he not also freely with him give us all things that means when we come here whatever your need is if he gave his son he will pay every necessary price to meet your need hallelujah would you give him praise in the house That's not the last meal. That's not the last meal. The last meal is talked about in the book of Revelation chapter 19. The last meal. The first meal took place without God. The first meal, Adam and Eve got together and shared the apple and rebelled and hid from God. But the fifth meal will happen in his presence. <laughs> Can you even imagine? John the Beloved set it up. He said there was a roar. There was such a loud roar of people. The, you ever been into a restaurant where there's a loud crowd and there are people are waiting on the food, and the noise in there? Yes, it's deafening. I can't imagine where there's a number that no man can number. I don't know if it's going to be one long table or a series of round tables. I don't know. I got a feeling it's going to be set up in a way that we never imagined. Richard's a real creative guy. He's the kind of guy that God would put on the table arrangement committee. He'd come up with a way to arrange the tables like they've never been before. I don't know how there will be, but John said, I saw them. And there was this noise, and it was loud. It was like the sound of many waters, the voices of all of them together.
And he said, and the angel said to me, write this. <laughs> write about this. Write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. There's an invitation. You got yours? Got your invitation? When I was a kid, I used to sing with my sisters a song that said, Packing up, getting ready to go. Packing up, getting ready to go. Got my sword, I got my shield, I got my ticket signed and sealed. <laughs> Who sealed it? The Holy Ghost sealed it. <laughs> got my ticket signed and sealed, and I'm packing up, getting ready to go. He said, these are the true words of God. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. The wedding of the Lamb has come. And he said, and the bride, the church, is dressed in fine linen. <laughs> this symbol, this is where we get white wedding dresses for our ladies. It's a symbol of purity. A lot of girls wear the white dress because they're trying to tell you something that ain't true. But they're the absolute truth that those who are invited will be pure. Made pure by the blood of the Lamb. By the workings of the slain Lamb. By Jesus Himself. Pure. He said in Ephesians 5 that he loved the church and that he would cleanse her with his own blood and purify her that he might present her to himself in splendor. I, I don't know what all that will be like. But John said she was glorious. And at that meal, the Lord himself will serve us. So... I found it interesting that in a society that loves food so much and is willing to eat whatever is set before us and finds any idea of denying ourselves food an unnecessary spiritual ritual, one that we have relegated to the dust pile of Christian preference. I would just rather not. Thank you, Pastor. You all go ahead, and if the church gets blessed, maybe I'll get on it, in on it. Maybe you will. But I'd like to conclude this before we pray with a passage from Isaiah 58. Now, I've already told you that he said that this is a fast that I've chosen. Come on, call him to the instrument. He said, if you pour yourself out, now this pouring yourself out is the kind of sacrifice that's going to demand something from you. It always amazes me when we have the fast because... There are some of you that your work is so hard that I feel like you shouldn't fast and do without food. All I don't know how you can perform. Some of you are construction workers and some of you work in landscaping and some of you just do hard physical work from the time you arrive on the job. It's just all you can do. You know, Mitchell has 50 head of cattle and some of them weigh 2,000 pounds and they're all faster than him. And so whenever we head into the fast, he knows he's small and my wife is that way. And I worry about them when I see them fasting. And I say, don't. Because I don't want you to be in harm's way. But it always amazes me that some people that shouldn't do, they just wait in and pour themselves out. I don't know what drives them. I don't know what their need is. I don't know why they are so desperate to obey and what they're seeking God for. But he said here, if you will pour yourself out for the hungry. I'm not just talking about people that need natural bread, but I'm talking about the hungry of our city. My God, we're surrounded by people who are desperate for a remedy, for a church that will be the church, for a church that actually is in touch with the Messiah, the living God, that actually knows how to lay hold of an antidote for what plagues our society and our culture. Hungry. Why do people pursue 
after illicit drugs. They are hungry. Why do people drink themselves into oblivion? They are hungry. Why do people engage in all sorts of, of, of incredible activity? They are hungry. They are empty. They are desperate. He said, if you will pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness. He said, you are the light of the world. Why would anybody hide their light under a bushel? Why would our lights burn low in Zion? Why would we allow that so that the people who desperately need direction and guidance have no light? He said, your light will rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. Even when you are at your darkest, it'll still be like noon to people who are stumbling in darkness. And, and the Lord will guide you. Anybody need a little guidance? Just a little divine insight? The Lord will guide you when you need it. The Lord will guide you when you're lost. The Lord will guide you continually. And satisfy your desire in scorched places. I don't know about you, but I feel like that I'm living in a desert. I feel like I'm surrounded by parched land that's void of hope or life. He said, I will satisfy your desires in scorched places, and I'll make your bones strong. <laughs> you know what the bones are? The bones are the inner structure. It's the inner structure of your living body. It's the inner structure of your family. It's the inner structure of your church. It's the inner structure of your organizations and your efforts. He said, I'll make your bones strong, and you shall be like a water garden, like a spring of water, whose waters do not fail, even though you're in a parched land. You will be a source of life for all who come, and your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. One of the things that happens to our senior saints is that we lament the days of the past when it seems that the Word of God went forth more freely and it was more uh, willingly received. And nowadays it seems like it's hard to break through. And we long for how some things, there was a time, some things from our ancient past was better. Some of those things have fallen into ruins. But he said, I will restore your ancient ruins. I don't want all of that stuff back, son, but there's some of that stuff that we need back. And he said, I will rebuild your ancient ruins. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets to dwell in. I'll close that right here. The restorer of the breach. Jeff Swain is a military man. And so in, in war, you know you're in war. You know that. A war to the death. It always amazes me. People come here and feel like they've got their feelings hurt and, and they can't come here any longer. And they walk into harm's way. Whenever they leave, they not only put themselves in peril, but they leave an opening in the wall and now there's a breach and the enemy is always looking for a place for the weakest link in the chain a place where the church is vulnerable so the enemy always seems to have a way in and he said I will if you will pour yourself out you will be known as the restorer of the breach so that the streets will be a safe place to dwell The streets of Lexington are not safe. The parking lot of your favorite mall is not safe. The sidewalk of your neighborhood is not safe. I don't want to make you uncomfortable, but your church is not safe. We've got security cameras. We have men guarding the entrances for you right now. Did you know that? Because the church is not safe. When was the last time you read in the news? where someone came into the sanctuary and shot the preacher. He said, if you will pour yourself out, I'll make your streets safe to dwell in.
places where you walk, where you live, and conduct life. I'll make it safe again. We are giving up an awful lot in exchange for all we can eat buffets. We're giving up an awful lot in order to be able to eat the fruit that we choose. We're giving up an awful lot to redefine and say that's not that important. And I'm telling you, it may not be important for the person sitting next to you, but it may really be important to you. You don't know what's coming your way in 2014. We say with a smile, Happy New Year, and mean it. But 2014 could be the best or the worst year of your life. But if you want to set yourself up for success, be very intentional and recognize that there could be a meal. Your decision to eat or to obey Him in not eating could be something that transforms things, not only for you, but for your household. Anybody interested? I am. I am for myself. I don't want 2014 to be 2013. So Mitchell, did you have a bad year? No, it's a pretty good year. I, I, I would compare 2013 to, you, to your average airplane flight. We didn't crash. It's about the best I can say. No thrills, no grand pictures. I, I, I'd like for this year to be wonderful. Oh, well, Mitchell, do you have a right? Oh, yeah. I have a right to expect a wonderful year. One time I was speaking out on the West Coast. This company had flown me out there in their private plane. They told me where we were going and said that we would fly near Mount St. Helen. And during the flight, I asked the pilot, would he mind getting off course and making my flight wonderful? And let's circle Mount St. Helen. And so he called whoever he has to call and got permission and went down low and banked that plane and we flew around that mountain that our mighty God just blew the top off that thing. It was wonderful. I never forgot it. I don't, I've flown, I guess, a thousand times and most of them I don't remember at all. Now sometimes they're awful. I remember those. I remember the one that my plane slid off the runway. I remember the time that we landed three times. Bam, bam, bam. That pilot told us on a speakerphone, he said, I'm going to record myself three landings for that one. I never forgot that one. God places so much in our hands. You think that your life is left up to choice. And as believers, you think because God is sovereign, if it's His will, it'll happen. That is a myth. It's not God's will that any should perish. Will any perish? Yes. Why? Because God's will is not always done in the earth. That's why you are to pray, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You can alter what takes place in your life by simple, intentional obedience. I mean, I'm looking... You have a right for a wonderful year. You know why? He said his name shall be called Wonderful. You weren't here because I preached it on a Wednesday night. I said, if you could have been there, when Pharaoh backed the children of Israel up against the Red Sea and there was no way out and no options and no weapons and no hope, and you could have seen Jehovah open up the Red Sea and the entire nation march across on dry land, and then Pharaoh's army drowned, you would have said, that was wonderful. How'd you like to have a year like that? If you could have seen a crowd of 20,000 hungry people sit down on a hillside with nothing to eat and watch Jesus multiply a basket of fishes and loaves and feed a multitude till there was food left over and everybody's bellies were bulging, you would have said, that was wonderful. How'd you like to have a year like that I'm saying let's not settle for whatever comes our way in 2014 but instead let's obey him in the fast and ask him for great and mighty things <laughs> hallelujah yes
Richard, there have been promises over your life for years. Why not grab something wonderful in 2014? Some of you have been praying that your children would be saved for years. Where's Dr. Lois? Praying for a son that cannot break free. But 2014 can be a wonderful year. I mean, why not? Say, God, I'm just going to walk into this thing. I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to obey you. I'm going to pour myself out. And I'm doing it for the hungry and for the afflicted. And you said if I would. You know what he said? You ought to read the whole 58th chapter. He said that your health would spring forth speedily. Some of you have been sick for years. And the doctor said, well, it took you a long time to get in this shape. If you ever get out, it'll take your health could re be restored suddenly. Wouldn't that be wonderful? His name is wonderful. Wonderful. So, well, Mitchell, I'm in the middle of a storm. I think my ship is going down. That's where the disciples were. And they awakened our sleepy Lord. And he lifted his sleepy head and whispered, peace, be still. And those angry waves became a glassy sea. I don't believe one ripple tickled at his boat. I believe the sea became a mirror. And the wind fell deadly silent. No wind at all. He said, be still. He didn't say, take it easy. Somebody wrote the song. He said, settle down. He didn't say, settle down. He said, quit. That'd be wonderful if God were to speak quit into somebody's life. So here's the altar call this morning. Stand with me all over the house.